Jeremiah chapter 1, we are launching a whole new series titled, A Mustering of God's Motives in Making Us. Wow, that was really thought-provoking. That's a really interesting series. By the way, we will get back to the Gospel of John in about six weeks. I just thought it would be really nice for us to take a break. And uh, dine on some different scrumptious food. So, a mustering of God's motives in making us. Wow. You know, when we were kids, is, can you relate to this? It was really fun when I was a kid to make mud pies. My mom was so gracious as to allow me to take her baking pans out, and she would turn on the, the garden hose and, you know, make some mud, and I would create these really awesome mud pies and it was a lot of fun it was a huge part of my childhood it was awesome it, I have an image here for you that I think is pretty cool <laughs> did any of your mud pies have worms in them anybody no okay well even though they didn't I bet they were still pretty cool here's another image remember that I'm trying to help you just take a trip down memory lane here. And, you know, you got your hands all dirty and your feet all dirty. And your mom or dad or whoever was like, right on, a little dirt doesn't hurt the kid. Come on, build up his immune system, having a lot of fun. I got one more image. That one I absolutely love. That kid's facial expression. He is so proud of showing mommy his scrumptious mud pies. So, at this point, you may be thinking, okay, why are we talking about mud pies? Well, the reason why is because it makes for a really great analogy that is spiritual. It's best encapsulated in the C.S. Lewis quote. And I have it on your paper. It's also on the screen. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition and what? feverishly pursuing the promotion at your job at all costs or having your self-worth wrapped up in how many likes or followers you got on social media or your favorite rock band or your favorite sports team or what have you fooling about with such things because why? You're deceived into thinking that such things will give you ultimate satisfaction. Nothing wrong with fooling around with such things. As long as you're not deceived into thinking that you'll have ultimate satisfaction through such things. So C.S. Lewis went on to say, you're fooling about with drink and sex and ambition and what have you, when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. This leads me to a question. That term, infinite joy, oh my goodness, do you have it? That's the question. On your note sheet, you could either circle a Y or an N. Be honest about this. You know, if you put an N, that's not uncommon. You know, we're in this process of growing in our faith and I've met a lot of Christians who would have to circle an N rather than a Y. And why would that be? Because they believed a lie from the enemy. When they read the word and they discover these really amazing verses that talk about infinite joy, they think, oh, but that couldn't be for me. That's for the missionaries. You know, that, that's for the modern day apostles or whoever. What a lie from the pit of hell. Infinite joy is offered to all who place dynamic faith in the Lord Jesus. I'll just share one of a handful of verses that teach us about this joy that Jesus offers. 1 Peter 1 verses 8 and 9 says, Though you have not seen Jesus, like we don't see him with our physical eyes, right? You love him. Even though you do not see him now, you believe in him. You are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Is that awesome or what? I decree and declare, all of you, if you 
are not filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy that you will be. You will be by the end of this message. Praise God. Listen, joy has nothing to do with emotion. Right? Emotion, that would be happiness. You could be happy one moment and something bad happens and then you become sad or angry. Right? No, joy is this deep, abiding, unwavering reality in your life that even though situations can all of a sudden take a turn for the worst, it doesn't affect this infinite joy in your heart. I have a really cool illustration to support this. I found online super awesome. A third century man was anticipating death. He pinned these last words to a friend. It's a bad world, an incredibly bad world. But I have discovered in the midst of it a quiet and holy people who have learned a great secret. Man, these words are so awesome, I'm going to say it again. He penned these last words to a friend. It's a bad world, an incredibly bad world. We can relate to that, right? But I have discovered in the midst of it a quiet and holy people who have learned a great secret. They have found a joy which is a thousand times better than any pleasure of our sinful life. They are despised and persecuted, and they care not. They are masters of their souls. They have overcome the world. These people are Christians. And I am one of them. Praise God. Listen, if you're not there yet, that is God's will for you. He wants you to get there. He wants you to experience the infinite joy that C.S. Lewis was writing about. He wants you to experience joy inexpressible that the unknown author of that quote is talking about. A thousand times better than any pleasure of the world. Oh, man, that's awesome stuff. Look at your neighbor and say, that's awesome. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Welcome, everyone, to message number one in a new series titled, A Mustering of God's Motives in Making Us. What does mustering mean? A muster is a military term meaning gathering together of the troops for a uniform inspection or to prepare to go into battle. And we are going to muster together. In other words, we're going to get inside God's head. We're going to gather together or muster his motives in making us. His motives are obviously pure, right? First, though, let's establish the fact that he did indeed make us. Now, that's a really strange statement for me because for my whole life, basically, I never doubted that God made me. I never fell into that deception that I was a result of many billions of years of evolution and it all started in primordial soup. But... We all know people that are like that, right? And we need to be praying for them. And this information will also bless you with things you can share. We're in Jeremiah chapter 1. I'll give you one more opportunity to turn to that while I pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord. We love you. We're so grateful that your word teaches that infinite joy is offered us, a joy inexpressible, a glorious joy. And Lord, I thank you that we'll learn a lot more about that, as well as some other really awesome truths regarding why and how you made us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we are only going to read two verses. We're going to start in verse 4. If your eyes are there, shout amen. amen. This is obviously Jeremiah speaking. He says, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, quote, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. 
I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. I have four takeaways in these two little verses. Let's dive in. The first takeaway is this. The word of the Lord desires to come to you. Think about that for a minute. Our Heavenly Father is the same Heavenly Father as Jeremiah's. And our Heavenly Father don't play favorites. That's what Romans chapter 2 teaches. God does not show favoritism. So think about that. In this context, God doesn't have a favorite child. I don't know if any of you grew up thinking, yeah, my older brother or sister was my parents' favorite. Or maybe you're saying, I'm the favorite one, it's obvious. That, to me, ah, I don't like that kind of parenting. I don't think it's really healthy. And our Heavenly Father doesn't play favorites. He is, looks upon you as his favorite child. In fact, all eight plus billion people on the earth, those who have placed dynamic faith in Jesus and have been adopted into his family, every single one of them is his favorite. He favors every single one of us, just like he favored Jeremiah. What's the point? He desires to come to us, too, and speak to us, too, like he did Jeremiah. How? Primarily through his word. Primarily through the B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth. This word that I'm holding, it's God-breathed. In other words, God literally wrote it using breathing instruments to write it. He used people to write it. And those people were absolutely overwhelmed with the Holy Spirit, having absolutely no free will of their own as they were penning. Every jot and tittle was in accordance to sovereign God's direction. So this is a big deal about how he speaks primarily through his word to us. Now, obviously, he speaks in other ways. He speaks through prophecy. He speaks through a multitude of counselors. He speaks through circumstances. He speaks through having a perfect peace in your heart. And when that's gone, he's trying to bring something to your attention. He speaks to you in different ways, yet this is the fundamental way. If you think that you heard a word from the Lord and you share it with somebody and they learn, the Bible doesn't teach that. That's, that, no, that's not true. That person is correct. It is not from the Lord. So this is really interesting that what I'm holding in my hands can be such an intimate supernatural experience that I can have regarding my back and forth with Creator God, my Heavenly Father. Jeremiah chapter 33, your Heavenly Father says, Call to me, and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. So when I wake up in the morning, I love calling upon the name of my Heavenly Father. I love saying, Good morning. Father, I love saying thank you so much that your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Thank you so much that you'll be with me, that you'll provide for everything that I need. I just burst out in worship, and I burst out in intimate communion with him. We need to do the same. It's natural for children to do this in a healthy relationship. It is natural for my kids, even though they're getting older now, to... When they see me in the morning, hey, good morning, Dad. Did you sleep well last night? I did. Thanks for asking. And we're engaging. Same thing with you and your Heavenly Father. Flip it around. God says, my sheep listen to my voice. So we were just talking about us calling on Him. He calls out to us on a regular basis. We know His voice. We're intimately familiar with His voice. And we follow him. That's awesome. So in the same way that I will engage with my kids, 
It's like, I ask them the same thing. Did you sleep well last night? When Lily comes home from work, how was your shift at work? Oh, you had this challenge? Oh, opportunity to encourage you. Or some major breakthrough that Jake has, and I celebrate with him. And I'm like, right on, man, so proud of you. This is a great example of how your heavenly father desires to commune with you, right? It's amazing. The Bible is God's love letter to you. And he really desires to speak to you the same way he did with Jeremiah and all of the other prophets and kings of old and apostles and so on. He favors you just the same because he doesn't play favorites. Let's move on to the second takeaway here in our main passage. Look at verses 4 and 5. The word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Let's isolate those three words. I knew you. That's interesting because we would immediately think, yeah, the foreknowledge of God, he knew when we would be born, he knew when we would be reborn, what kind of career we had, who we would marry. Of course, because he's God, right? He knew us even before we were born. So it's like you're omniscient, God, or all-knowing. That's one of your attributes, yeah. But when you look into the original language, in the Hebrew, that word knew is yada. Look at your neighbor and say, yada. It's more than just this 40,000 foot view of, oh yeah, I know that person and I know what's going to happen next, right? In the same way that uh, I would know some famous person, do I really know the person intimately, right? Because the word yada means to become intimate acquainted with. Here's the thing about your Heavenly Father. He, prior to you being born, He absolutely knew every single tear you'd cry. I mean, He's there with you when you're crying. He's, he's crying with you. He, he's empathetic. He, he knew every moment of spontaneous laughter and He laughed and celebrated with you. He knew every mistake you would make and every mistake you're going to make, and every sin that you commit, and yet his love for you is constant. It does not change. He knew and will know every single accomplishment, both small and great. He's in the moment. You know, Danica reminds me every once in a while, hey, this is a big moment for the family, this accomplishment that our child is experiencing or you know our wedding anniversary or whatever it may be it's like hey are you in the moment here come on don't be thinking about work or anything else you got to celebrate this you got to relish this moment because it's not going to remain you move on to the next moment right god is in the moment every single moment of your life he's there and he is not just there he's intimately engaged with you whether you realize it or not first john 3 and verse 1 i sure hope that as a result of what i'm sharing with you all your heart is welling up to this point see what great love the father has lavished on us that we would be called children of god wow that's what we are Jeremiah 31 says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. Psalm 86 says, Lord, you are compassionate. You are gracious. You're slow to anger. You're abounding in love and faithfulness. That's amazing. I have other supporting verses that you could look up on your own regarding this particular takeaway. Let's move on to the third takeaway, though. As I read these couple of verses, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. 
And then I thought about the words, I formed you in the womb. Let's isolate those. That's amazing to think about. He formed you in your mommy's tummy. You weren't just some blob of tissue. God was forming you in his image. Genesis chapter 1. God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. What he did was, unlike the previous days of creation, how did that come about? He spoke it into existence, right? But what did he do when he created Adam? He knelt down in the dirt, in the grime of the earth, and he formed him from the dirt, and then he reached down and he breathed life into him. Yeah. And, and, and that's how intimately involved he is when you were conceived in your mommy's tummy. I'm reminded of Luke chapter 1, John the Baptist. In the same way that John the Baptist leaped for joy inside his mommy's tummy, Elizabeth, now, Elizabeth and Mary are related to one another, which means John the Baptist and Jesus are related to one another. And when Mary came to visit Elizabeth, Jesus being in her tummy, and she walks through the door, and Elizabeth's like, whoa, he just leaped for joy. And they burst out in praise together. And it's an incredible moment that they had, that little baby filled with the Holy Spirit and upon the arrival of his Savior oh man come on life begins at conception and in the same way that John the Baptist was very much alive so were you when you were conceived human life is sacred to God he is the author of life he alone has the right to give and to take away life. I know that can be an extremely sensitive point for many people. And I just want to let you know that if that's extremely sensitive for you, that healing is available. I know. I know that it's available. Danica and I have ministered to many people over the decades who have an extremely hard time with this truth, yet healing is available and it's a matter of accepting this truth in the word. You know what I mean? Some people, they cause their hearts to be hardened and they go down the wrong path, a path that leads to death. But the path that leads to life and peace is a path that says, okay, I, I, I accept this truth. And I'll be on the path of healing. Isaiah 49, beginning in verse 1, says, Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he spoke my name. <laughs> wow, what an experience the prophet had, huh? And then he spoke again in chapter 4. 49, he says, this is what the Lord says, he who formed me in the womb to be his servant. That is wonderful. That brings me to the fourth and final takeaway. As I read these two little verses, at the end, Jeremiah wrote, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet for the nations prior to conception I set you apart I appointed you for Isaiah I mean Jeremiah he appointed him to be a prophet to the nations what has he appointed you to do and to be because let me tell you something you have an eternal purpose in your life. God had foreordained that you fulfill that purpose. So you fill in that blank. 
your customized answer, what is it for you? Would you write down, it's to be a godly parent and to raise up my kids in the ways of the Lord. I will do whatever is necessary to ensure that they are raised with a biblical Christian worldview, which leads to life and peace. Or is it for your grandkids, you have that same role? Or is it as kids, you could write down, he appointed me to honor my parents. He appointed me to be in a formal ministry. Whatever it is, formal or informal, we are called to minister we're all called to be ministers. So everyone has a customized answer. All of them are different, I would, I would guess. You're appointed to be the best employee that your company or business you're employed at has ever had. In the name of Jesus, to give him glory. Many ways to answer this statement here. You were formed in your mother's tummy for a purpose. It's an eternal purpose, and it's not for you to live a painful life of drudgery. God does not call us to that. He calls us to a grand adventure. And this grand adventure, if you so choose to pursue his will for your life, this eternal purpose for your life, it matters. It matters for all of eternity. This tiny little sliver of time you have on the earth impacts all eternity. And the day you breathe your last breath, it's over. You enter into eternity, and whatever you did in your life on the earth will be shown and you're going to, if you decide to be unconditionally devoted to the Lord, man, you have some indescribably glorious things in store for you on the other side. So, this eternal purpose that I've been talking about, the Lord gave me this cool formula. Eternal purpose equals an overall sense of gladness. Listen, if gladness is a reality in your life, kind of this deep, abiding, unwavering reality like joy, if that is a reality in your life, you're fulfilling your eternal purpose. You could just say, yeah, praise God, I'm, I'm fulfilling it, right? And Hebrews 1 and verse 9 says this, you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Look at your neighbor and say, yeah, that's me. I love righteousness. I hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your unsaved companions by anointing you with the oil of gladness. Praise God. That's awesome. That is really amazing. You have some other verses there you could read on your own to give you more insight into eternal purpose and how it equates to an overall sense of gladness. I'll share one more with you. Second Timothy chapter 1. If you're ready, shout amen. amen. God saved you. He called you to a holy life, not because of anything you've done. You can't earn it. You can't earn salvation. He saved you and called you to a holy life by His mercy. Because of his own purpose and grace. And this grace was given to you at the appointed day and time. And you just naturally responded. This grace was given you in Christ Jesus even before the beginning of time. Wow, that's really amazing to think about. But pastor, go back to this eternal purpose thing. You said I have an eternal purpose. Well, how do I discover that specific purpose in the kingdom? Because I really want my life to count, man. I, I have this desire. I'm just like, wow, God, use me. And I want to be used by you in a way that generates infinite joy, that generates gladness. Here's how. 
<laughs> Some of you who have been with the church for a few years, you know this. It's great to have a reminder. The acronym is SHAPE. S stands for spiritual gifts. By the way, this is how God shaped you. This is your DNA. This is how he formed you in your mother's tummy. He downloaded spiritual gifts, very specific gifts. Did you know there's four spiritual gift lists in the New Testament? Wouldn't it be cool to know about those and which ones you have? Yeah, next Sunday after second service, that's week three of the membership class, all of you are invited to come and take a spiritual gifts assessment, and you can learn about these gifts, and then you could be, you know, you have your radar, it's like, oh, wow, okay, I'm gifted with mercy, or I'm gifted with prophecy, or prayer, I'm called to be a prayer warrior, right? All of us are called to pray, but some of us have a special gifting of prayer and that's the person you want to know in the church so you can go to them for prayer right spiritual gifts lots of different gifts heart that's your passion what are you truly passionate about in life what's your number one passion if I were to ask you after a church what gets you up in the morning what is it that really really excites you that's what heart stands for abilities some of us have mechanical abilities some of us artistic abilities, academia, and so on and so on. God desires to use your abilities to glorify Him. Personality. So there's 16 different personality types. Say you're introverted. Well, perhaps you're not called to be on the, the power evangelism team, right? But you are called to be on the prayer team who's interceding at church while the power evangelism team goes out on the streets. But if you try to, as a round peg, cram yourself into a square hole, you're not going to be happy, right? God desires for you to, to serve him specifically in alignment with how you're shaped. So you also have experience. A lot of us have unique life experiences, right? And somebody's going to walk through that door on a Sunday morning and you're the one appointed by the Lord to minister to them because you've gone through something that they're currently going through and you can share your testimony. You can share your victory and you can provide the wisdom that they need. And you can walk them through it as a discipler. Praise God. Everybody say, praise God. <laughs> okay. Well, hey, let's... Let's wrap this up. In closing, you see number four, it says he appointed you to fill in the blank. Well, here's one that was applicable for everybody. A specific answer to the last point. He appointed you to experience infinite joy. Ah, uh, I see what you did there, Pastor. You're tying the very beginning of the message to the end now, right? The term infinite joy. Uh, by C.S. Lewis. It's in his quote. And C.S. Lewis started off with his quote by sharing a couple of examples of mud pies, right? Drink and sex and ambition and name your flavor, right? And he says, no, don't have your whole life wrapped up in something that will not ultimately satisfy. Don't deceive yourself in such fashion. Jesus said it in a different way. He said, that if you continue to drink from this well, then you're going to be thirsty again regarding the woman at the well, right? Well, how many wells are there in our culture that you can drink from and realize, man, drink from the well of living water and you'll never thirst again. In other words, experience infinite joy. Uh, Jake in Brooklyn, can you please come up? And Jake, can you provide some... Background worship, please. Wow. So at this point, you guys may be thinking, I want that. Yeah, tell me how. Tell me how to experience infinite joy or how to maintain that. Well, the one who made you offers you infinite joy, but you need to let go of whatever you're fooling around with to have it. 
Like, take what Brooklyn's fooling around with. She got her mud pie. Oh, she doesn't look too happy either. It's like, maybe she was happy at the beginning, but now, you know, she's not happy anymore. She was deceived into thinking it would give her ultimate satisfaction, but it's not anymore. See, here's the thing. You need to let go of whatever you have. And then, I bet in the beginning you thought that was all beautiful, huh? But not really anymore. Looks kind of gross, yeah. I hear you. Listen, her hands are full. She, she can't have what God desires for her because her hands are full. So it's like... It's like Jesus meets with her and is like, oh, okay, how's that working out for you? Not that great. Not that great. Yeah. I'm so sorry. You know I was there with you. I remember when you were crying about that mess. Yeah, you make stuff, like messy stuff, it turns into a messy life, right? Yeah, whatever it is that you guys wrote down on your note sheet, it's like, well, listen, why don't you just give that up? You don't, you don't want to give that up? Maybe your, your, your self-worth is wrapped up in it, or maybe you, like, get some sort of comfort out of it, right? You're attached to it, attached to the pie. But, oh, my goodness, what I have for you, though, <laughs> infinitely greater. Do you believe that? Give it a try. You can give it a try, yeah? Well, what does that mean? That means you're going to have to hand it over. You all right with that? Yes. Trust me, trust me, trust me. Okay. Just... There you go. Oh my God. Infinite really joy. Good. Yeah, it's like the most indescribably glorious gift ever, and she takes such delight in opening it. So you're responsible to open it. That means that God is going to say, well, hey, now that, now that you gave that up, well, here's what I want you to do next, right? Like, I want you to get prayer, or I want you to get counseling, or I want you to, you know, um, sever that toxic relationship, or whatever it may be that you had your self-worth wrapped up in, or thought you were going to be happy with, but you're not. But I couldn't give her that until she gave up this, yeah. So, hey, why don't we all stand? And I got another really cool thing that I want us all to do. Thank you so much, Brooklyn. Appreciate it. Let's give Brooklyn a hand. Praise the Lord.